He called WTTW producer John Davies and invited him to film the dismantling of that old plane, a British de Havilland Comet. Well, that afternoon, Davies began an odyssey that would take WTTW crews to Scotland, England, Tucson, Seattle, and Washington, D.C. On this program, we will trace the evolution of the comet. We'll examine the rivalry between British and U.S. manufacturers of passenger jets. And we'll explain how a 27-year-old British jet ended up derelict at O'Hare. It was July, 1949 in Hatfield, England. Sir Geoffrey de Havilland had just unveiled the first passenger jet. This is the story of the de Havilland Comet, the plane Sir Geoffrey hoped would make Britain the world leader in jet transport. It seems incredible that in 1943, while still battling Hitler's Germany, the British were so confident of victory, they began to plan for peacetime. Specifically, they were concerned about commercial aviation and, jumping ahead of their competition, the Americans. Winston Churchill decided to set up a small committee under Lord Brabazon to examine the possibilities of what might be required in the form of civil aircraft after the war all the way from North Atlantic requirements to short-haul feeder line aircraft. The second Brabazon committee recommended the development of five different passenger planes. Brabazon 1, although it never entered service, was a huge North Atlantic airplane. Brabazon 2, eventually called the Vickers Viscount, was designed to replace America's DC-3 on short routes. Brabazon 3, the Bristol Britannia, would be used on medium-range empire routes of two to 3,000 miles. And Brabazon IV would become the Comet. Developed under the aegis of aviator and industrialist Geoffrey de Havilland, the Comet was conceived as a small canard-winged three-engine jet that would ferry mail and a few passengers across the North Atlantic. Later, de Havilland moved in the direction of a full-size passenger liner. Now, designers debated whether or not to employ a swept-back wing and to eliminate the tail. To this end, a small tailless fighter jet, the DH-108, was test flown. It proved unstable, and the tailless concept was abandoned. But why tell the competition? We built the Comet in complete secrecy. The whole factory was privy to this secret and never revealed it. One of the uh, items of disinformation that the chief designer perpetrated was to keep a model on his desk of a tailless jet airliner so that all his visitors, and especially American visitors, uh, believed that we were going in for something really advanced. Finally, the principal de Havilland design team, Ron Bishop, Richard Clarkson, and Bob Harper, settled on this shape. Now they could move on to other engineering and aerodynamic concerns related to the performance guarantees de Havilland had made to the British airline BOAC. Although it's a common practice today, BOAC, now British Airways, ordered 14 comets before the prototype had been built or tested. The comet was unique in a great number of respects. Of course, in total, it was proposing to carry passengers at twice the speed and twice as high as anyone had ever done before. To carry passengers at twice the speed of propeller-driven craft, it would be necessary to build and test powerful new jet engines. The British had been working with jets for a decade, and by the late 40s enjoyed a comfortable lead in jet technology. To reduce drag, the engines were buried in the wings, two on either side of the fuselage. They were clustered close together to give the plane more directional control, to keep it moving in a straight line should engines fail. Another feature which we chose for its low drag properties was the rather unique shape of the windshield. And this was tested by fitting a mock-up of the Comet windshield shape onto a, the nose of a surplus wartime troop-carrying glider and towing it around in the air to give the pilots an idea of what the vision field would be like. Because of the new high speeds, over 500 miles an hour, 
De Havilland designed the first fully powered hydraulic controls to help the pilot handle the craft. To fly at the unprecedented height of 40,000 feet, where the air is too thin to breathe and the temperature drops well below freezing, but where jet engines operate most efficiently, a special pressurized cabin was designed to provide the passengers with sufficient oxygen and a comfortable environment. De Havilland chief test pilot, John Katzeis Cunningham, the decorated wartime flyer, had extraordinary night vision. At least that's the false explanation given by the British during World War II to account for Cunningham's 19 night kills and to disguise his use of early radar from the German enemy. In his early 30s, during the Comet years, he tested jet aircraft systems and gathered data that were crucial to Comet development. On July the 27th, 1949, uh, the press had been invited to Hatfield to watch the first hops that I was going to make with the Comet. They were successful. I was very happy with those. And by 11 o'clock in the morning, the aircraft was put back into the hangar to recheck everything, thinking that it would be ready for its genuine first flight the next day. So the press returned to London, and later my crew came and told me they were happy with the aircraft, and it was all mine. So I said, right, we're going, and it was a fine evening. Well, sadly, no press. next day, the press thought we had fooled them. In fact, I had only taken advantage of the weather. Everyone felt here was the dawn of a new era. Here was the beginnings of jet transport, and here's this marvelous little silver aeroplane with no engine sticking out, everything buried. A smooth, tremendously exciting new formula. Something absolutely fresh. For 13 days, the Comet enjoyed the status of being the world's only passenger jet. Then on August 10th, 1949, Canada's A.V. Rowe Company unveiled the Avro Jetliner. Chief designer James Floyd intended the plane to fly short distances and employ short runways, like those used by today's 737s and DC-9s. Floyd felt there would be great demand for this short-haul jetliner, and the 52-passenger jet immediately caused a sensation as it hopped from city to city across the United States and Canada, demonstrating its 520 mile per hour speed and commercial potential to airlines. Millionaire industrialist Howard Hughes was so impressed with the plane, he flew it for personal use and considered building them in the U.S. But the Korean War prompted the Canadian government to order A.V. Rowe to allocate all of its resources to the production of military aircraft. The jetliner never entered commercial service. The prototype was eventually scrapped. The Comet's future would be rosier, at least for a while. Six weeks after her initial test flight, the Comet was presented to the public at Britain's Farnborough Air Show. And then, in her BOAC airline colors, began a series of trial flights that set a new standard for speed, spanning the globe in record time. London to Copenhagen in one hour, 18 minutes. To Rome in two hours, six minutes. Cairo, five hours, seven minutes. Karachi, flying time, 10 hours, 21 minutes. Johannesburg, 15 hours, nine minutes. Singapore, 19 hours, 26 minutes. Now, the Comet was attracting attention from the royal family. The royal visitors were welcomed by Sir Miles Thomas, the chairman of British Overseas Airways, at the stand showing one of the most exciting of all the exhibits. Yes, it's that famous jet airliner, the Comet, the world's fastest passenger plane. It was 1952. The trial flights were over and the world's fastest passenger jet could take you in complete comfort and relative quiet to exotic places to meet exotic people. The Comet had 
in its first year of operation, uh, one takeoff accident due uh, to the pilot over rotating and putting the tail of the aircraft on the ground before it was really at the correct speed to take off. It was followed unhappily by a rather similar incident happening on a comet on its takeoff from Karachi. Those accidents were pilot errors. Nevertheless, de Havilland made a minor wing modification. And for eight months, nothing more occurred to disturb public confidence in the comets. Then, on May 2nd, 1953, six minutes after the comet climbed out of Calcutta, the airliner disintegrated. Again, on January 10th, 1954, another fatal accident after taking off from Rome. Now the comet was suspect and temporarily grounded. It returned to service, and three months later, another disaster. The OAC and the British government grounded the jet a second time. We were extremely disturbed and uh, immediately set to work doing a lot of flying of uh, specially instrumented comets, going through every possibility that might have caused this accident. The shock, as I recall it, throughout the whole company at every level was very deep. An exhaustive and unprecedented investigation by the Royal Aircraft Establishment, including pressurizing and depressurizing the comet fuselage in a giant water tank, would reveal the skin had ruptured and the cabin exploded. But why? The investigation showed that the cause of the accident was the failure of the pressure cabin near a window. The failure began with a small crack here, developed over a period of flights. That's the position of the window that failed with the cabin fully furnished. The weakness discovered at the corners of the comet's windows and hatches and the craft's thin metal skin combined to make the plane vulnerable to the daily stress of pressurizing the cabin. These much publicized investigation results acquainted the public with the terms metal fatigue and explosive decompression. The whole of the world benefited in new aircraft development from the comet tragedies. It was bad luck for de Havilland leading the field that they were the people that took the brunt of it. The Boeing Company of Seattle, while designing their first passenger jet based on the KC-135 military tanker, would carefully note the comet's design flaws, tragically aggravated by the repeated stress of pressurization. The prototype 707 would have a tear-resistant structure and a thicker skin. Larger than the comet, its four jet engines would be mounted under the wings in pods. On July 15, 1954, Boeing President Bill Allen unveiled his company's biggest financial gamble. Flown by John Cunningham's American counterpart, test pilot Tex Johnston. John Cunningham is uh, almost the opposite kind of character to Boeing's chief test pilot, Tex Johnston, who uh, is a very outgoing character. Uh, John Cunningham is a very laid-back English gentleman. Tex Johnston wears a Texas hat, wears a Texas boots. John Cunningham is, I wouldn't say introverted, but reluctant to talk about himself. Tex Johnston and John Cunningham talk exactly the same language when it comes to being test pilots, but they talk an entirely different language um, in the literal sense of the term. Although I did not meet Tex Johnston at that time, I watched uh, his progress, and when I saw the picture of the 707 being barrel rolled in flight, I thought, oh dear, he's going to be very unpopular with his management. I did two rolls that day. After I completed this first one, I did a 180, came back, pulled up, and did another one. That day was in 1955 at the Seattle gathering of the International Air Transport Association. 
whose members included every airline in the world. Tex thought he knew his audience and was determined to sell the 707. He did know the capabilities of his aircraft, and the barrel roll would hardly stress the multi-million dollar jet. At least that's the explanation Tex offered Boeing boss Bill Allen. His comment was, uh, you know that, now we know that, but just don't do it anymore. Tex continued testing the 707 and Bill Allen's nerves. In May of 1955, the French entered the jet age with a short-haul Caravelle, seen here in United Airlines cars. The Caravelle took its nose design from the Comet, but was never intended to compete with the British jet. 20 days later, the Soviet Union introduced another short-range transport, the Tupolev 104. Based on a Soviet bomber, the jet had a surprisingly ornate cabin and entered airline service ahead of the Caravelle. By February 1957, a redesigned Comet was readying for a comeback, attempting to convince the airlines and the public she was airworthy and safe. Britain's Comet 3 prepares for a record-challenging round-the-world flight from London, a dramatic introduction to the aviation world for the new jet transport, completely redesigned from the earlier models after a series of crashes in which 110 were killed. The new Comet showed its mettle in a 42-hour flight to Australia, 7,000 miles at some 600 miles an hour. Interest centers around the third of the famous Comet family, the Mark III prototype. Designed to fly longer stages with heavier loads and with a seating capacity of up to 76 passengers, this latest comet will keep Britain in the forefront of jet airline travel. As if the 707 wasn't enough competition, the Douglas Company of Long Beach, California would further complicate de Havilland's efforts to put Britain in the forefront of jet airline travel. In May of 1958, Douglas introduced the prototype DC-8. The four-engine jet was capable of cruising at 592 miles an hour with over 170 passengers. The DC-8 was doing well in its trial flights, and the 707 was almost ready for service with Pan American. Now, de Havilland and BOAC were going to have to do something spectacular to capture the public's attention. The Comet 4 went into service and flew the first east and westbound flights from London to New York on October the 4th, 1958. By then, we realized we had lost our advantage uh, of being years earlier than anyone else with the first commercial jet. In spite of the setbacks and disappointed disappointments, we were still able to be claimed to be the first on the North Atlantic. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. This is your captain. Welcome to the jet age. Just 22 days after the Comet inaugurated North Atlantic jet service for BOAC, the 707 crossed the Atlantic for Pan American. The 707 would soon dominate the multi-billion dollar world airliner market. And we'll be in smooth air above the weather, cruising in sunshine all the way. By the time the DC-8 entered service, although preferred by many of the world's great traditional airlines who had stuck by Douglas and believed in the Douglas name, uh, by this time, the Boeing started churning out 707s at a very high rate of knots. And Pan American, in fact, had really put a girdle around the earth within two years, mainly with Boeing 707s. The Comet 4 wasn't big enough to compete on the North Atlantic. The 707 carried twice as many passengers. To stay competitive, BOAC had to buy the 707 and move Comets to other routes. I started flying uh, on Comets in 1960 with BOAC. This was my first aircraft. I'd never been inside one before. This was, after all, the first jet airliner, and we all felt we'd been specially chosen for the aircraft. It was a very, very smooth flight. Quite small in the interior. We carried 68 passengers. 
We did, of course, fly to the Far East. We flew to Hong Kong and Africa and India. The most exciting thing about the comet was its takeoff. As soon as we were wheels up attitude on climb, we had to get out of our seats to rush round to collect drink order and you felt as if you were climbing Mount Everest. It was so steep. Comet 4 put us back into the uh, happy position of having a, a very reliable transport which continued in service up until 1980. My final involvement with the Comet family was during the development of the Nimrod, which is the military version of the Comet, still flying in the Air Force today. son of Comet, one might call it, its successor is the Nimrod. And the Nimrod is the Comet fuselage on top and the Comet wing, exactly as it was, stiffened up and strengthened. Nimrod is a Royal Air Force maritime reconnaissance airplane doing a splendid job looking out for enemy or potential enemy submarines anywhere in the North Atlantic. My name is Group Captain Dick Gould and I'm the station commander of RAF Kinloss in the north of Scotland. And our mission here is to fly three squadrons of Nimrod Mark II aircraft. Uh, that means that in wartime we would be required to conduct anti-submarine warfare operations and anti-surface unit operations. And in peacetime we train for those wartime roles. And also in peacetime we have a search and rescue mission as well. The bulbous Nimrod III an AWACS, or Advanced Warning Craft, has been plagued by electronic problems and, ironically, will be replaced by the Boeing 707 AWACS. So it's uh, history repeating itself in a way that 707 succeeded the Comet for civil work, uh, AWAC Boeings are succeeding the Nimrods for AWAC work, for the early warning work. So history has gone full circle. Today, there are still two original Comet jetliners in flying condition. My name is Flight Lieutenant Alan Snowball, and here at the Aeroplane and Armament Experimental Establishment at Boscombe Down, my prime responsibility is for the everyday running of our Comet 4C, Canopus, named after one of the brightest stars in the heavens. The aeroplane is used extensively for navigation equipment testing, and was delivered directly from the de Havilland factory having been built in 1963. This slightly modified Comet 4 is also a flying laboratory. It carried passengers for BOAC before being delivered here to the Royal Aerospace Establishment in Farnborough, England. The British are proud of their aviation history. Here, at the Royal Air Force Museum in Cosford, the tiny 43-passenger Comet 1 is carefully maintained for future generations to see an example of the first jetliner. This Comet 4 at the Imperial War Museum in Duxford, England, initiated BOAC's first transatlantic jet service. Now in Dan Air colors, it stands in the tail shadow of another famous British jet. Comet 4 at London's Heathrow Airport still performs a valuable service, helping emergency crews practice firefighting techniques. The Boeing Company has preserved its history in the desert climate of Tucson, Arizona, where the 707 prototype has been in storage for 18 years. In 1990, Boeing prepared it for a flight to Seattle, Washington, where it will go on display just a few miles from this Comet 4C, painted in BOAC colors and used for training aviation technicians by a local community college. The Seattle Comet was operated by Mexicana Airlines, as was its sister ship, XANAS, abandoned for years at O'Hare Airport. The craft had been flown to Chicago in 1976, where it was to be purchased by a nudist colony. The sale was never finalized, and the comet slowly deteriorated, until rescued by the O'Hare Rotary Club. 
I received a call from Ross Jacobs in Chicago who realized that there was a derelict comet sitting on the airfield there and was in danger of either subsiding into the earth of O'Hare Airport or being cut up for scrap. But if we were to uh, get a team of people and dismantle it and ship it to your museum, would you like it? And not wishing to look a gift horse in the mouth, I said, yes, indeed. Team Comet was put together some two and a half years ago and consists of a cross-section of people from uh, O'Hare and the surrounding communities. They have one great thing in common is that they're all aviation enthusiasts and they see the opportunity to save a piece of aviation history here in our Comet. And we have people who are uh, commercial airline captains, we have people who are automotive mechanics, we have retired gentlemen from all walks of life, and we've benefited tremendously from that cross-section of knowledge. Most of our work is uh, uh, wrench work. Uh, we have to understand that we don't want to get hurt taking this big airplane apart. Uh, others in our community are furnishing uh, such things as penetrating oil. We've used gallons of penetrating oil already just to get some of these rusted parts off. Uh, we are in the process of enlisting help from companies like British Airways and other companies who have the expertise to guide us in our efforts. I advised them at that time that if they'd come to me, really, in the early days, I'd have recommended it, the left aid, because it was such a big task. So I went out to give them some advice and technical matters, such as removing the wings from the main spar. We just did not want to see this thing destroyed. It's much too important in our air industry, not only in the United States, but throughout the world. O'Hare wouldn't be the world's busiest jet port if not for aviation pioneers like Sir Geoffrey de Havilland, who introduced a propeller-driven culture to the jet age and changed the world with his revolutionary comet. The impact of the comet was tremendous. It's very difficult to imagine the world today without jet transports. To me, the comet is a, a thing of beauty and a joy forever. Uh, I shall never forget when I saw it in its first year at the Farnborough Air Show. I look on it as a, uh, a great achievement to have set a standard over 40 years ago, which practically all the world enjoys today in its air travel. First Jetliner will be presented again tomorrow night at 10.30. Stay with us now as Nova takes a broad look at man's quest for speed in the air. Fastest planes in the sky is next here on 11.